Buenas tardes a todos. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos en esta actividad. Les recordamos que al conectarse a esta conferencia autorizan el tratamiento de sus datos personales, los cuales serán tratados de acuerdo a la ley 1581 del 2012 y nuestra política de datos personales, la cual la pueden consultar en www.cardinfantil.org. De igual forma, les informamos que esta conferencia está siendo grabada y obviamente damos un especial agradecimiento a General Electric, eh, quien se vincula como patrocinador exclusivo de esta actividad. El chat de preguntas, recuerden ustedes que se encuentra habilitado en la barra de participantes. Les agradecemos que a medida que transcurren las presentaciones vayan dejando allí sus preguntas, las cuales resolveremos al final de la sesión. El día de hoy tenemos el honor de contar con la participación de dos grandes expositores, eh, los doctores Leslie Cooper y Matías Friedrich, y daremos paso eh, eh, de nuestra presentación con el doctor Leslie Cooper. Hi, Dr. Leslie. Uh, he is a cardiologist and president of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Florida. He completed his internship at Stanford University, graduating from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. His research clinical interests focus on clinical and translational studies of undiagnosed uh, rare cardiomyopathies cardiomyocarditis and shock diseases. Dr. Cooper is a member of the American College of the Cardiologists and is a member of the Heart Failure European Society. Welcome, Dr. Cooper. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Maria Giuliana. This is great to be with you today uh, from uh, the other hemisphere up here. It's really been uh, an incredible year for all of us and, and stressful, and I'm looking forward to next year when we can be together again in person. But today I'd like to take the first 20 minutes or so of this session to give an overview of the clinical presentation and management of myocarditis. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to ask for a bit of feedback to make sure you can see it. Uh, Maria Giuliana, yeah. can, you, can everyone yeah. see the screen? Good. We, we can see your screen, Doctor. Good, good, let me get that out of the way. So we're gonna cover a little bit of epidemiology, a little bit of clinical pearls on when to identify the serious causes of myocarditis, and then uh, management. We'll go over the specific management of giant cell eosinophilic and sarcoid at a high level, and then there's gonna be plenty of time at the end for questions. So I have no... except it won't advance, just a second. There we go. So we have, I have no uh, disclosures. For epidemiology, uh, in 2015, when you look at myocarditis and cardiomyopathy together, there were 343,000 deaths across the world. We combine myocarditis and cardiomyopathy because the diagnosis is made in much of the world by echo. And echo, as compared to MRI or biopsy, doesn't allow for tissue characterization and the distinguishing of a, a non-inflammatory from an inflammatory cardiomyopathy. So of the 343,000 deaths, 200,000, the majority were in men, as you can see in the blue, and a minority or 143,000 were in women. That ratio of uh, greater men than women is true in almost all studies of myocarditis because it is a hormone sensitive infection. Enteroviruses uh, are uh, more virulent in the setting of high testosterone, and um, estrogen is relatively protective. The rate of death on the right, you can see, has been about five per 100,000 over the past uh, 25 years from 1990 to 2017. So out of 3.1 million cases in 2017, only a few hundred thousand actually died. This is a, a global map of the 2019 uh, distribution of myocarditis specifically. Uh, this is in rates of death per 100,000. And you can see Eastern Europe, Asia, have relatively high rates uh, compared to uh, the US, South America, where it's in the middle. And places like Canada and Japan have very low rates, relatively speaking. Overall, in 2019, uh, these data were published last month in October in Jack. Uh, there were about 1 million uh, cases of myocarditis. 
specifically. Now, myocarditis presents in four ways, as chest pain, either as myopericarditis, which is pericarditis with elevated troponin or new regional wall motion abnormalities, or a ST segment elevation-like presentation of a myocardial infarction with normal coronary arteries. Both of them have similar and usually pretty good outcome if the heart pump function or ejection fraction is normal. Sudden death is uncommon, but it's very important. We're only going to touch on it briefly today. We're going to spend most of our time <coughs> on acute dilated cardiomyopathy and then just touch on the chronic uh, cardiomyopathy. The first paper, uh, which is going to lead us into outcomes, <coughs> excuse me, is from Italy. This was published a few years ago and shows uh, the typical uh, presentation of mild myocarditis in the study of 374 patients, 95% of whom presented with chest pain, normal heart pump function with an ejection fraction of 62%, and mostly male. There were very few events, only 26 out of these 374 patients had any event, and most of them occurred in, in the setting of a less common pattern of antireceptal delayed enhancement illustrated on the left. You can see that the typical pattern of either infralateral uh, delayed enhancement or uh, LGE patterns at the insertion points of the right ventricle, which can be normal, had relatively low event rates of 1% per year or less. Similarly, from Italy in the same year, Enrico Amoretti published this study of fulminant myocarditis. At the top, you can see the Kaplan-Meier outcome curves for people who did not have fulminant disease as defined as requiring inotropes or mechanical circulatory support. And the event rate was very low, uh, zero uh, rate of death or transplant. And the 35% event rate in the other group is, was noteworthy because 28% of that occurred in the first uh, two months, as you can see at the left side of the Kaplan-Meier curve in black. And so it's very important to realize that people who have normal LV function, chest pain presentation, generally do very well. And people who present with uh, impaired cardiac function, particularly those who require inotropes or have hemodynamic instability from ventricular tachycardia have a high rate of events. And that's uh, one of the most important uh, ways to suspect specific forms of myocarditis, such as giant cell myocarditis. We had a uh, scientific statement that was published this year in January from the American Heart Association, focused on the sickest of the patients, the ones with fulminant presentation we just saw. And there are a few highlights that I'd like to point out for all of us who are watching or practicing cardiologists. The first is that in the fulminant disease, you can get low voltage EKGs reflective of myocardial edema with acute injury currents sometimes. Sometimes you find uh, features of pericarditis with pressure with walls. Uh, is, is very uh, is a significant clue for acute and sometimes fulminant myocarditis. Troponin is usually elevated, and in the acute setting, there is not enough time for the ventricle to dilate, so you tend to have a relatively normal end diastolic dimension. This is from our scientific statement, uh, which was published now four years ago in uh, circulation, and this reiterates the importance of clinical presentation. When you suspect myocarditis, in that acute cardiomyopathy setting, you should ask four questions. The first is, was there a need for, is there a need for inotropes or mechanical circulatory support such as a balloon pump to maintain perfusion? The second, is there high grade heart block? Third, or is there symptomatic or sustained ventricular arrhythmias? And finally, are they failing? Are they getting worse despite guideline directed therapy? In this setting, if any of those are positive, you should consider a biopsy to look for specific forms of myocarditis. Otherwise, at that time, we recommended cardiac MRI with a uh, 2B level of evidence C recommendation. Today, with additional data, I think Matthias Friedrich will review. Uh, we would, I would increase that to a 2A level of recommendation. So from our retrospective and prospective studies in the 1990s and early 2000s, we showed that giant cell myocarditis, which is one of the most severe forms, but uncommon forms of myocarditis, representing about 1% of myocarditis, is characterized by a rapidly progressive course over a few weeks, 
failure to respond to usual care, frequent ventricular arrhythmias, and in about 5% high-grade heart block without other explanation. And so when you find this, uh, when we did prospectively, 29% of our screen subjects meeting these criteria actually had giant cell myocarditis. A study from Johns Hopkins uh, identified about 20% in this phenotype who had a specific and treatable disease. Because giant cell myocarditis has about a 90% rate of death or transplant, it is important because if you make the diagnosis, you can A, list people for transplant or transfer them to a center where transplant is performed, uh, where there's mechanical circulatory support available, and you can consider multi-drug immunosuppression. This is but one example of a patient of mine uh, from Rochester, Minnesota, who had severe myocarditis on the left. You can see there's just about one surviving myocyte. Uh, and then after four weeks of immunosuppression, essentially resolution except for a few foci of lymphocytic infiltrate. And uh, very important to get cyclosporin-based immunosuppression if possible on board early. This paper actually was published two days ago. Uh, it's our most recent paper on giant cell myocarditis. And uh, this is a, a, just a systematic review of the literature looking at mechanical circulatory support. One of the remaining questions uh, which I think is still unanswered completely, is whether immunosuppression should be given in addition to a balloon pump or a impella because of the risk of, of infection. And this study, which again reviewed uh, the literature, which consisted of uh, 43 cases of giant cell myocarditis supported by uh, mechanical circulatory support, showed that the survival overall was better if you gave immunosuppression before the mechanical circulatory support, and it was worse if you did not give any immunosuppression. Uh, as you can see below, uh, in univariate analysis, it was significant. It was a trend in multivariate analysis that immunosuppression was helpful. Again, I show this because it's a relevant question, and the paper just came out two days ago. The second disease that you want to look for is eosinophilic myocarditis. Again, this is a paper from Italy uh, three years ago showing that in red, in the Kaplan-Meier curve, you can see there was about a 50% rate of death or transplant or circulatory uh, support with a VAD uh, after four months in this group of patients who had hypersensitivity-related eosinophilic myocarditis. A very important subgroup of people. In our population, they would certainly be the most common group of patients who have eosinophilic heart disease I show on the slide on the left, a perivascular eosinophilic rich infiltrate, very typical of hypersensitivity myocarditis. Uh, there are certainly other forms as well histologically, but this is uh, important. You often, but not always, will have peripheral eosinophilia and a minority, a substantial minority of these patients will have skin rash or elevated liver function studies. Important to think about it in the setting of a patient who has a new cardiomyopathy unexplained in the setting of a new drug exposure, such as clozapine. This is an example of clozapine, an antipsychotic that has a rate of one in a thousand of myocarditis. That's a high rate. If you develop this complication, which uh, the likelihood of dying is about 25%, and almost all of the cases occur in the first two months. This is also true, by the way, of checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis, similar high rates of, of fatality um, and almost all the cases occur in the first two months. Now, what about just routine lymphocytic myocarditis? Uh, we know from the myocarditis treatment trial that was published 25 years ago this year that routine immunosuppression with cyclosporin or azathioprine with prednisone does not change recovery of left ventricular function and does not change uh, survival over five years. On the left, you can see the primary events uh, the primary endpoint was LV change in left ventricular function at week 28, and it was essentially identical in the immunosuppression and control arms of this trial. But there are some times when lymphocytic myocarditis is incredibly helpful. In uh, pediatric cases of acute cardiomyopathy, it's one of the better signs for recovery, or in the setting of a bad, a bridge to recovery in adults. So this is what Dallas criteria positive histologic myocarditis looks like. And I think uh, Dr. Friedrich is going to go into um, the issues uh, comparing histology with MRI. Uh, 
because today, at least in the most, uh, in the less severe cases, we usually use MRI instead of biopsy to establish the diagnosis. The trouble with these criteria is well known that there's a substantial sampling error. It's very specific, but it's sensitive. Uh, there's a lot of variation interpretation and it doesn't correlate with outcome. Instead, newer criteria, which have been evolving over the past 25 years, uh, use immunostains. These uh, on the left for CD3 show T cells, CD68 for the macrophage monocyte line uh, in the middle. And if you have more than 14 of these for high powered field, that would meet a new criteria, the European uh, criteria for myocarditis. And it is important because in some cases, particularly in more chronic cardiomyopathies, uh, a higher rate of CD3 or CD68 positive cells as illustrated here is associated with a greater risk of death or transplant. Now, if you look at the x-axis, those are years of follow-up and it takes between six and 10 years of follow-up to demonstrate a statistically significant difference in outcome. And so it's important to realize that it is true, this is a marker of bad outcome. The question then becomes, is immunosuppression indicated and for what duration to uh, lower this? And with lowering that uh, rate of a number of positive T or cells or macrophages change outcome. The next uh, section I'm making a segue into is sarcoid. Sarcoid is a unique kind of myocarditis characterized by granulomas in the heart. And of course, sarcoid is a multi-system disease. Lungs, lymph nodes, brain, skin can all be affected. And in the case of cardiac sarcoid, about 50% of patients will have extra cardiac disease that can be biopsied to confirm the diagnosis. In the case of pulmonary sarcoid, about 5% would have clinically uh, manifest cardiac disease. This study from Finland looks at young people under age 55 who had idiopathic heart block, a complete heart block requiring pacemaker placement. And when biopsies were performed in both the left and the right ventricle, uh, there was a 25% rate of giant cell or sarcoid, and the likelihood of death of transplant was about 50% over the next five years in the patients who had uh, biopsy-proven inflammatory cause. Important, we would biopsy or at least do an MRI before, if possible, before pacemaker placement in our patients who are younger with idiopathic complete heart block. Sarcoid is a tough disease to make the right diagnosis. And I think we'll see that both PET scanning and cardiac MRI are incredibly useful uh, in this effort because of sampling error on the biopsy. The current Heart Rhythm Society guidelines recommend uh, the diagnosis, if you can, by heart biopsy for definite. But if you don't have a heart biopsy, then an extra cardiac biopsy that shows granulomas along with one of these criteria. There are similar criteria in the Japanese Circulation Society. And I would note that there is one paper, uh, we published an abstract form showing that even if you can't get a biopsy, just meeting the clinical uh, and imaging criteria gives you a similar prognostic value, similar rate of death or transplant or bad placement uh, with or without the biopsy. The reason heart block is sarcoid is because it likes the base of the septum. The uh, features of a basal septal aneurysm I'll show in a moment. You can also get isolated right ventricular involvement, just like you might see in a bad arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. There are not many diseases that can do uh, take the right ventricle out in isolation. Sarcoid is one of them. It's important to consider that along with lymphocytic myocarditis and there's some overlap. Here you can see a patient of mine, or Echo, from uh, a few years ago. She lives in Chicago. She's still awaiting transplant, I believe, uh, locally there. And you can see the base of the septum is thinned and aneurysmal. It's moving in the wrong direction with each systole and there's a bit of compensatory hypertrophy down the ventricle. She had cardiac sarcoid. The FDG and uh, ammonia dual isotope PET scan is shown here. And this is a very typical finding for sarcoid. As you know, we really don't do uh, nuclear imaging like this for typical uh, non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. But in the setting of suspected sarcoid, a young person with high degree heart block, for example, the finding of a decrease in perfusion on the left with ammonia 
associated with a matched increase in metabolism can lead you to the diagnosis and, uh, and treatment with uh, prednisone, usually with a steroid sparing agent. We also use voltage mapping in the right ventricle. You can see here a normal uh, voltage map in purple with areas of scar or fractionated signal illustrated in different colors. In this case, the area was way up near the tricuspid annulus and it was not amenable to biopsy. We couldn't get the bioptome to curve far enough, which is a problem with this. We do use immunosuppression for sarcoid as we do with giant cell and eosinophilic disease. In the case of sarcoid, we usually start with methotrexate with or without low dose prednisone. Uh, sometimes depending on the severity of disease, we may choose a TNF alpha inhibitor or a um, rituximab depending on the heart function. For giant cell, as I mentioned, it's usually a cyclosporin-based immunosuppression. And for eosinophilic myocarditis, it's always corticosteroids. Again, sometimes with an anti-IL-5 strategy like mepolizumab. Now there are two, thing, two last uh, uh, conditions I'd like to end on. The first is the newer checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. I'm sure you've seen patients who are treated for cancer and get cardiac complications. And the newer uh, one is, is really with the checkpoint inhibitors, uh, pembrolizumab, uh, nivolumab, ipilizumab uh, are the BMS products for anti-PD-1 or PD-1 ligand or anti-CTLA-4 uh, chemotherapy. And the rate of myocarditis is between uh, 0.3 and 1% uh, higher if you get combination therapy. And the onset of the disease when you get it is usually within the first month. Uh, it can be very severe and sudden, complete heart block, ventricular arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, shock uh, are not uncommon. And overall, the likelihood of death transplant or bad, but not transplant death or bad, is about 46% uh, in that first three months. So very similar to the eosinophilics uh, with hypersensitivity myocarditis, very high rate. The current recommendation, and there are three guidelines uh, in this regard, is for high-dose methylprednisolone, one to two milligrams per kilogram. And sometimes we would add a second agent, such as um, abatacept, which is an anti-CTLA-4 uh, uh, monoclonal antibody. The role for heart biopsy or MRI remains to be determined um, because these people are often pretty sick. It is not always feasible to get an MRI in this setting. And my last topic is really the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is COVID-19. As we've all seen in our practices by now, uh, COVID-19 can have profound effects on the heart, particularly in the older uh, hospitalized patients with elevated troponin. But the way that the virus can affect the heart is multiple, either through a sepsis-like syndrome and cytokine storm, stress cardiomyopathy, microvascular thrombosis, or sometimes, uh, particularly in the younger patients with no pre-existing disease, myocarditis. And the clinical presentations illustrated here include acute coronary syndromes, which are pretty uncommon, the acute cardiogenic shock with arrhythmias, and sometimes we've seen one or two cases here of pericardial effusions with or without tamponade. It's very hard to sort out all of these mechanisms clinically, uh, and what we recommend is supportive care. Uh, and now we have more than supportive care. We have redemsevir, we have the monoclonal antibodies early on, and hopefully with a uh, vaccine in the next year or two, uh, this will be all behind us. But uh, myocarditis is part of the spectrum. Uh, it can occur and, it, and it, there can be long lasting effects. And one of the big questions I think is in young athletes, is there going to be a long-term effect uh, from the, the cardiac injury? Whether or not it's caused by classic myocarditis, is there a viral injury? And I'll illustrate here in green, these are the viral spike or nuclear capsid proteins on the left and right respectively, infecting cardiac myocytes and um, on the right, uh, mononuclear lymphocytes. And uh, you can get uh, cardiac, this is a, a patient, one of the patients we were involved with, who we demonstrated you know, cardiac involvement of the virus not all that common, but when it does happen, it can uh, lead to significant arrhythmias. Finally, uh, my last slide is here on, on uh, MRI as a bridge really to what Matthias Friedrich is gonna talk about. 
suggesting that um, there have been a number of papers uh, in the older, sicker patients who are hospitalized. Uh, there's a pretty high rate of abnormal MRIs in the SARS-CoV-2 infected patients, even two or more months out from the initial injury after recovery. And in the young athletes, there's a lower but still significant rate of cardiac MRI abnormalities. To date, I don't think we have, do we know the clinical significance of these, but we're gonna hear more about MRI and the evaluation, I think in a few minutes. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'd really like to thank you for your, uh, your attention here. Well, thank you, Dr. Uh, Cooper, for your conference. Um, I would... it, did it stop sharing? Yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. okay. Well, Great. thank you, Dr. Cooper, for your conference. Sure. It was amazing. Now um, I'm going to pass the microphone to Dr. Mauricio Mejia. Dr. Mauricio. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cooper, for such a wonderful uh, speech. Uh, vamos a continuar con el Dr. Matías Friedrich. Eh, es un honor tenerlo aquí. Y antes de comenzar, quiero agradecer a todo el grupo de imágenes vasculares, cardiovasculares avanzadas de la Cardio Infantil por esta invitación. Uh, Dr. Matthias Friedrich earned his uh, MD at uh, Alexander University in Erlangen, uh, Germany. Uh, he completed his training as an internist and cardiologist at the very prestigious Charity University Hospital uh, uh, Medicine, Medicine Center at uh, Humboldt University in Berlin. After appointments uh, with the University of Calgary, uh, and the uh, University de Montreal, uh, in Montreal Heart Institute. He's a full professor with the Department of Medicine and Diagnostic Radiology, Chief of Cardiovascular Imaging and Scientific Director of the Courtois Cardiovascular Signature Program at the McGill University Health Center in Montreal. Uh, he's a staff cardiologist at the Royal Victoria Hospital He's an active researcher with strong interest in novel imaging techniques using cardiac MRI for visualizing myocardial disease and leads a team of more than 20 scientists. He's authored or co-authored more than 200 peer-reviewed publications with over 1,600 citations. He was the founding president of the Canadian Society for Cardiovascular Magnetic Resonance and is a past president of the Society for Cardiovascular MR, SCMR. It's a real honor to have you here, Dr. Friedrich. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much for the invitation and uh, the pleasure to, to be part of this uh, initiative. And of course, also a shout out to Carlos, uh, one of your cardiologists who currently spends the time and uh, we don't wanna miss him. Uh, and he, he's contributing a lot here in, in Montreal. So I will share my screen. Um, and I uh, hope you can see it. Just let me know. Yeah, we are watching. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we are watching. Okay. So um, I will talk about cardiovascular MR in patients with myocarditis and will also refer to COVID-19 because I know that this is currently of special interest, I think, to all of us. Um, first, I want to... Um, uh, want to say that I'm uh, also... A receiving research from uh, I'm also involved in software development uh, with the company uh, Circle. So uh, imaging plays a key role in cardiology and uh, only few cardiologists would ever make a diagnosis in any patient without having at least one set of images. So that's why it's important among the, uh, to talk about imaging. Among the imaging modalities we have, um, the four big ones, uh, um, they will all have to look at uh, what they actually can provide. And it's also important to keep in mind that advanced cardiovascular imaging over time has to be less invasive, use less radiation, less contrast agents, and also look for biomarkers. And also any of these techniques should be scrutinized for being accurate and precise having a prognostic value, but that alone doesn't cut it. It also has to be cost efficient. And most important, the use of this technology has to actually improve outcome. So it doesn't really uh, suffice to have beautiful images. They also have to be accurate 
they have to be cost efficient and the use of this technology has to actually help people. So with that in mind, when we look at the four imaging modalities we have in, in cardiology, um, each of the, those uh, modalities has a certain strength. Cardiac MR uh, sticks out because it is good at pretty much all of that. It's not as good as CT for morph morphology and it's not a bedside technology as echo. That's why echo will have to stay. And it's a very important uh, technology uh, in, in clinical routine. Um, and, uh, the, but for example, nuclear cardiology, from my point of view, is ready to be um, all, over time uh, replaced by uh, MR techniques. So MR in general uh, is a very versatile technique. So it's easier to say what MR cannot do than what it can do. But just as a few examples, you can look at function and morphology. Um, you can quantify flow velocity. So that's how we uh, can uh, actually provide very accurate data on severity of mitral valve regurgitation, for example can perform angiographies uh, with injecting uh, gadolinium. We can also watch the inflow of gadolinium into the myocardium and thereby defect perf de detect perfusion deficits. And just the last year has shown that um, this is currently the best technique we have. It is as good as FFR um, in the cath lab in making decisions for the patients and for the outcome but it uh, comes with less interventions. So it's, well, it's the better technique than even the current gold standard. But maybe the most important differentiator for MR is its ability to characterize tissue abnormalities. So we can see what's going on in the tissue. Uh, here, this is a, a patient with the reproduced infarction. So there are ways to visualize edema. That's here on the left side, we see the LAD territory is uh, bright, which means there's a lot of water, which is edema. But in the same patient, in the same MR session, you see that uh, with a contrast enhanced technique called late gadolinium enhancement or LGE, that only small parts of it are actually scar. So this is just the computer aided evaluation. So we can do a lot uh, with MR, but let's summarize the most important uh, contributions are actually um, it's the gold standard for the quantitative assessment of the heart. It can characterize tissue abnormalities. It can quantify flow. And there are some novel techniques that will make it even more unique um, for MR. For example, oxygenation sensitive MR, which I will not talk about uh, today. Now it's important that the quality of images in MR is very robust. So by far most of the scans are uh, diagnostic. Uh, in this series of six and a half thousand patients, only 1% was not uh, good enough. So when we look at uh, an example of acute disease, so here's a case where you could say, uh, you are roughly the function is probably okay, but if you look very carefully, you see that the motion here is not the very same. So it doesn't pull in that much in the short axis view of the here in the anterior wall. And the posterior wall looks a little bit funny. It's a little bit thicker and the thickening of the wall is also not that great. So if we look at the perfusion, we see that there are actually two areas that are not very well perfused. You see there's a lack of gadolinium here, one in the inferior and one in the anterior wall. So both could of course theoretically uh, be infarcts and true, both are infarcts. You can see that there is an anterior infarct here, the bright area, the bright scar. This is an LGE image or late gadolinium enhancement. And there is an infarct here in the circumflex territory. There's also some enhancement subepicardial, which uh, is, is probably a concomitant uh, reaction of the pericardium. So there are two infarcts, but which of them is now acute? You cannot see that on the LGE image, but when you look at the edema image, you can actually see that the circumflex infarct was actually the acute one. So this just shows how important it is with MR to visualize injury and also visualize whether this injury is acute or not. And as in the previous example, whether it's reversible or not. Because if, the, if you see a bright area in the late gadolinium enhancement images, that indicates this is serious damage. This is dead. 
Whereas uh, the edema alone does not necessarily say it's dead. It's just that it says that it's acute. So if you take the two images, you see that, yes, there is a dead area with both, but there is also an area here inferior where there is edema. And that's why it's probably the RCA, uh, but there is no scar, no subendocardial scar. So differentiating acute from chronic injury is important. And the edema imaging plays a huge role. And uh, here are another example is another example of how ischemic injury, like here with an infarct with several subendocardial uh, injuries that are typical for ischemic disease, how they differ from non-ischemic disease like myocarditis, where you have a more subepicardial or intramural damage. And that's the irreversible injury. And if we look at the edema, we see that compared to normal uh, people, people with acute injury have edema in a coronary territory, if it's a coronary pattern. And you can have that in the entire myocardium in a patient with acute myocarditis. So edema imaging is very important and no other imaging technology can actually do that. So this, these techniques are based on signal intensity. So you have a certain image and there's this higher signal intensity, in this case, representing edema. But uh, signal intensity can be subject to different aspects and the, it would be better to have a more quantifiable, more, more objective uh, uh, marker. For example, the water content here or the magnetic properties because that allows us to actually infer that there is more water in there. And this is, this is when we talk about mapping. Now mapping, and this is from the pay, first paper we published, that's almost 20 years ago now, where we could show that um, if you have an acute infarct um, and you inject gadolinium, that the so-called T1, which is one of the markers for the magnetic properties uh, of the heart, which is dependent also on the water content and an acute injury, so in a, in, uh, if you give a contrast agent, depending where it is, uh, the, in that area, the T1 will drop because the contrast agent makes T1 shorter. So you, what, we saw, what we saw that in the infarct region, the T1 was actually much lower, which is sort of expected. But what we also saw that even before we gave, gave contrast, so that was pre-contrast T1, there was a difference. And this time it was, different because in the infarct, the T1 was longer, which is simply explained by the fact that water, the edema in that acute uh, infarct has a much longer T1. So if there is more water, the T1 in that area will be longer. So water is one of the determinants of the T1, but there are others. And now fast forward, now we are at a point where certain diseases are lead to such strong changes of T1 that we can even make a diagnosis. For example, amyloid disease comes with a very strong prolongation of the T1. And whereas uh, lipid infiltration, uh, such as in Fabry's disease, leads to a shortening of T1 because fat does the opposite. So T1 mapping has added to that. So uh, what, what this looks like, and this is T1 here, um, in T2, and T2 mapping is actually the same. Here you see an example uh, in, in stress-induced cardiomyopathy, Takotsubo, which is characterized by a lot of edema, but no late enhancements or no scarring. You see that the T2, because there's a lot of edema, is massively increased and the diagnostic accuracy uh, together with the regional wall motion abnormality is very high. Uh, so if you have edema, a wall motion abnormality that looks like Takotsubo, you do not have late enhancement. This is pretty much 100% stress-induced uh, cardiomyopathy. So Takotsubo, here we are already talking about nothing else than inflammation because Takotsubo or stress-induced cardiomyopathy, that is a, a catecholamine shower that leads to an acute inflammatory response that leads to edema, but not necessarily to scars, not to necrosis. This is very important because this may be something that, and we will visit that, revisit that in, um, in a minute. Now, looking at everything we can do with MR function, morphology, we look at edema and at scarring, 
Then, of course, we have several criteria that uh, apply to myocarditis. And uh, last year, actually, it's already two years ago, uh, Leslie was also a co-author, uh, uh, and, and we, we as a team came together. It was actually a process of almost two years and, um, and updated the so-called Lake Louise criteria for cardiac MR in suspected acute myocarditis. And uh, now these here are a little bit easier than before. So you have only two criteria, edema and injury. An injury sounds non-specific, and it is because that may be reversible injury or irreversible injury. Uh, so not just uh, edema. And for each of those, we have certain MR criteria. Uh, and for edema, we have a high signal intensity in the water sensitive images or a long T2 in the T2 map. And for the T1 based criteria, we can use late enhancement uh, or the extracellular volume, which you can calculate from the T1 map before and after, and then the native T1, which is important because these two criteria can actually be fulfilled without using contrast agents, which is important because in a, in a young patient, you do not necessarily want to give contrast agents. Gadolinium is relatively safe, but still there is some evidence for uh, um, accumulation of gadolinium in brain tissue you and that's therefore we have to be very very careful with that so other criteria like dysfunction or pericarditis they help but they do not itself themselves um, represent strong and specific criteria so these are these this is the methods uh, these are the methods we're using to identify acute inflammation in patients with with a clinical a sus clinically suspected acute injury now the future, and let's just allow me one slide on that. The future will look, uh, and the future is already here, uh, even easier as an example for the novel techniques. I uh, show here uh, multitasking. MR multitasking is a new approach to MR where you have one data acquisition. So you press a button and then you acquire data for 10, 12 minutes. And then while the patient is already on his way home or her way home, you then can calculate from these data a cine image with a function, a T1 map or a T2 map. So everything is done in one session, no need to plan, no need to ECG trigger, no need to breath hold. So this is how MRI in the future will look like, not just in the heart, but everywhere. It will be much easier and also shorter. And this is very important. It's just one of the techniques. Another one is coming from Lausanne, the free running framework. The third one is called MR fingerprinting. And the fourth one is now coming from London. So this is how we probably will uh, assess for myocarditis in the future. Now, let me spend a few minutes on COVID. So, COVID is different from a regular flu. Um, and the key differentiators are probably the following. It is highly contagious during a period where the patient may still be asymptomatic because we have a lot of accumulation in the throat and the patient may not feel a lot. Uh, they may not even sense the loss of smell. And so they can spread it quite actively there. So that's one aspect. And the other aspect is once you have uh, the disease, then uh, the, uh, the immune response, uh, what we observe can be pretty dramatic. And the immune response is on one hand is just a uh, non-specific uh, massive response, especially in younger people. But then also it's very important to talk about the so-called ACE2 receptor because the ACE2 receptor that is usually involved in regulating blood pressure, but also vascular permeability. So it refers to the endothelium. Uh, that is basically the entry door for the virus. And by that, the virus may knock out the function of the ACE2 receptor, which then leads to more massive inflammation, leads to uh, an inflammation, especially of the endothelium and with the consequences. And these are edema in the tissue. And keep that in mind. Uh, inflammation of the endothelium, and because of that inflammation in the endothelium, also a higher risk for intravascular thrombosis. So these are the key differentiators. And here's just an example from one of the papers published in The Lancet, uh, where, they, where endothelitis could be uh, demonstrated. 
we know that cardiovascular involvement plays a huge role. So once you have cardiovascular involvement that is significant enough to cause a troponin increase, then the, the outcome of these patients is much worse than uh, if, if they would not have a cardiac involvement. So we know that uh, cardiac, cardiac involvement may happen in maybe 10, 20, maybe 25% of the cases. And once you have that, your outcome is really bad, again, in about 20% of the cases. So this is significant. We talk about already about 8 million people in the world, you may be affected by that. And this is even a relatively conservative uh, number. So when we talk about cardiovascular involvement and cardiac injury, what are we talking about? Mainly it's four, uh, four reasons for cardiac involvement. One could be just the RV overload because of the pulmonary problems. One could be the sepsis, just an overwhelmed system. And that is non-specific specific to any pulmonary, severe pulmonary infection. But then there may also be acute myocarditis. And uh, Leslie uh, already referred to that, uh, leading to heart failure or arrhythmia or even sudden death. And then there is acute ischemic injury that has also been observed, also way less likely, um, also possibly, possibly leading to heart failure and sudden death. Now let's look at some of the cases. Here's one that was published rather early during the pandemic. And uh, what, what they could see that with, with echocardiography, um, there was diffuse hypokinesis, but there was also a low grade inflammation in, in the, um, uh, in the um, immunohistology actually. And there was not a lot of myocyte necrosis, which is quite important. So a lot of inflammation, but not a lot of necrosis. That's different, for example, from giant cell uh, myocarditis. Here is another case where it ended up looking like a Takotsubo. So there was a lot of, in the echo, there was a lot of um, malfunction that looks like a Takotsubo, but in the MR, there was not a lot of necrosis, but there was a lot of edema looking like Takotsubo, this atypical form, like a so-called reverse Takotsubo. So here it comes back to what I said before, the, the phenotype may be actually similar to, a, to a Takotsubo. Now, MR is important because MR can differentiate between ischemic and non-ischemic disease and even the regional distribution in, in, in non-ischemic disease then uh, would, would, uh, would help um, uh, uh, differentiating among the various diseases and myocarditis is one of them. So if you apply the, uh, the Lake Louise criteria, um, then what have people found? So here's a paper from Germany, a case where the echo was normal in a patient with uh, COVID-19, a positive troponin. And what they uh, saw was, again, there was some pericardial effusion, a lot of edema with a high T2, a high T1, but no significant necrosis. And if you look carefully, you see something here on the, on the lateral wall, which was not really mentioned in that paper. But uh, what we saw in our cases was actually pretty similar. Here's one of the cases that we had, pericardial effusion, only minimal necrosis again at the lateral wall and massive myocardial edema. So any red here would indicate edema. So again, not much, uh, late enhancement, but lots of edema. Why is that? So I mentioned before the ACE2 uh, uh, receptor, and this is actually a paper long before COVID uh, that demonstrated that ACE2 actually protects from uh, lung injury by establishing um, or by reducing the vascular permeability. And we know that dexamethasone actually, and this is, uh, has also been shown in COVID patients that um, if you knock out the ACE2, uh, so um, uh, then you have more heart failure. So it's, it's uh, confirmed that this plays a role in, in patients. Uh, dexamethasone is known to stabilize um, um, vascular permeability, and that may be the reason why dexamethasone works in the first place in patients with COVID. And we have actually uh, published that, um, Javad Rafi, uh, first author, and medical hypotheses that how this may be related. So if you're interested in that, there's further reading there. 
So another important aspect is in more recently there have been uh, there have been reports on patients feeling fatigued but also lots of patients who say I'm not really fit since I had this covid I'm not getting back to my usual physical fitness so what's what's happening here and this is one of the uh, papers that have been published there was some late enhancement but especially persisting edema and that reminds us of the other cases of the acute stage, acute stage, but this is now after uh, the fact. Here's a case of ours who was actually, uh, we scanned yesterday, uh, referred to um, with a, a sudden drop of MR, not a recent acute uh, COVID patient, but you see pretty uh, extensive wall motion abnormality everywhere with some pericardial, pericardial effusion. And when we looked at, um, at, in, at that in more detail, uh, uh, then we saw again, there is not much late enhancement, but we saw again in the lateral wall a little bit, but not, but not much. But when we looked at T1 and T2, both was increased. Again, consistent with diffuse uh, edema. So um, that has also been reported in a paper that was quite controversial uh, from Germany in a series of 100 patients where they found cardiac abnormalities in 78% and possible ongoing inflammation, mostly based on T2, in 60%. Now, I think that um, this is a little bit higher than what I have read in other papers. From what I have seen uh, published, I would think this number is more in probably in the 20% range, but still a lot. So people once they had in the acute setting, acute COVID, they may be at risk to have a long-term problem with edema and low-grade inflammation. So let me summarize in COVID-19, the ejection fraction is mostly normal, but there are cases with a re reversible dysfunction. There's increased mycal wall thickness uh, associated with edema. Um, there's a lack of significant necrosis. There's Quite often there's pericardial involvement, although typically uh, more um, um, mild, but we need more data. Uh, however, safe scanning protocols are in place. So I encourage if you have access to MR to use that in, in patients with suspected COVID. And how this could have been done, this was published in radiology um, this year. Uh, so what we recommend is if you have a patient with a positive troponin, go ahead and do a cardiac MR if, if feasible in your institution. It allows it to differentiate myocarditis from uh, an ischemic injury. And if it's normal, do a follow up by echo. And if you see a, function, a decline of function or pericardial effusion, do a cardiac MR uh, then because it gives you a diagnosis. And by the way, uh, you can also at the same time um, uh, do a uh, uh, a prehensive scan, where you also look at the lungs. This was actually uh, an incidental finding of COVID in the lungs by an MR that was done for other reasons in the chest. The Society for Cardiovascular MR has put out uh, now two position papers that uh, describe in detail how this could be done. So in summary, uh, CMR uh, is the most efficient, and that's not just true for COVID-19, but in general, is the most efficient diagnostic tool in patients with suspected myocarditis, acute myocarditis. Scanner access and scan duration are still limitations, but there are new techniques that will shorten and simplify the scanning. So with that, I want to thank you for the, again for the invitation and uh, happy to welcome any questions in the discussions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Friedrich, for your excellent conference. Uh, I think we have a lot of uh, questions. Uh, Dr. Medina, um, Mejia, si quiere, empezamos con las que van para el Dr. Friedrich, y yo ya hago las de Cooper. Perfecto, gracias, María Juliana. Uh, Dr. Friedrich, um, there's a question about uh, how, how do you obtain reference values for your own T1 and T2 uh, mapping values in your own scanner. And uh, what do you think about using uh, quote unquote normal patients like uh, medical students or should we use uh, phantoms for, to do that? 
Matthias, you're on mute. Sorry, I forgot. This mute button makes a lot of <laughs> calls a lot of issues. So in, in short, um, while you need phantom studies to basically calibrate your scanner and, and that and such for for T1 mapping and T2 mapping and clinical application, you need to establish your own normal values. So ideally you use a range of people where you are sure that that they are healthy. So not just patients where you don't see anything, you then you may may end up with the with the wrong reference value. So uh, in our institution, thanks to uh, some excellent students who worked on that, we have established a set of normal values. And with that, you can then go one step further. You can then use the so-called Z scores. So you can generate a value that um, that can be used in any other institution, the same value. Uh, so that you can compare between institutions. So um, that's what we uh, do. And I would recommend, if you do not yet have these values, it's, it's a bit, bit more tricky. You can certainly use values that have been acquired with the same scanner and the same field strengths in other institutions, but that's just, just as a bridge until you can do it yourself. Uh, there's another question regarding uh, Dr. Friedrich's um, lecture. It, Somebody wants to know if uh, MRI is equally sensitive to detect a right ventricle uh, compromise in any inflammatory cardiomyopathies uh, because of its uh, smaller uh, thickness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, it's challenging. The right ventricular wall is thin, so you certainly will not have the same diagnostic accuracy. What we can do, though, is we can look at right ventricular function, which is a prognosticator in acute myocarditis. And we have certainly seen cases where if the image quality is good and you have right ventricular wall edema, you will see that. And also, you, you may also see the, the lake enhancement, although we have to be aware the diagnostic accuracy is definitely limited. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Maria Juliana. You can go ahead. Okay, I have uh, a question for Dr. Leslie Cooper. Really, I have three questions. The first one, how important is the presence of viral genoma to treat patients with viral myocarditis? Sure. So uh, how important is the viral genome analysis to guide therapy? And uh, there is a dis difference of opinion on this. I think that low copy number Parvo B19, less than 500 copy number, is generally thought to be insignificant. And uh, the current, there's a trial actually that should have been published in the last couple of weeks uh, from Maastricht looking at a randomized control trial looking at IVIG for the treatment of chronic Parvo B19 positive cardiomyopathy, uh, which was negative. Uh, it did not impact outcome. I think that. Uh, there is definitely a prognostic value to enteroviral and adenoviral genomes at high copy number. I think looking back through the last 25 years or so, there's a, um, a pretty strong theme that there's prognostic value. Those uh, pathogens are less common now. We do see them, but they're in the single digits. So I think it, it, the, the real question is, what about HHV6 and high copy number PBB19? And I don't think we have treatment data other than the BIC trial, which uh, was published a number of years ago in the International Journal of Cardiology uh, about five years ago, uh, that um, we don't have treatment data. So I think that the answer is it is useful in uncharacterized cardiomyopathies and certainly for research in, in acute and chronic, more, more chronic than acute cardiomyopathy. But it, the, currently you get prognosis out of it um, more than you get therapeutic guidance. And I, but again, uh, there's a difference of opinion. Yep, number two. Okay. Mm, this one I think is for both of you guys. It says, how often do you guide the biopsy using the late gadolinium enhancement and the edema to increase the sensitivity and guide therapy? Great, so Matthias, I'd love to take this together since the, half the question is about uh, MRI guidance and you know, there was this great paper that came out um, uh, approximately 10 or 12 years ago from Germany that said that you could use MRI, uh, I think it was out of Stuttgart, uh, uh, Sectum, uh, Udo Sectum's group maybe, that said you could use MRI to guide uh, uh, biopsy to increase sensitivity. 
And then I, I don't think that panned out because it's very hard to look at an MRI image and turn your biofilm. Um, what we do use is in sarcoid, because we know that with sarcoid, the yield of a blind biopsy in the RV septum is quite low. Uh, we don't, we expected sarcoid, we would almost always do voltage mapping and try and use the voltage mapping to guide the biopsy because if it's normal, right? You're never going, you're very, very rare to get an abnormal biopsy in a normal uh, greater than five millivolt voltage map. And that would lead us to go to the left end if we needed the diagnosis. So, so for me, I don't use MRI to guide the location biopsy. I use voltage map and, and my practice. But Matthias, you see the MRI world a lot more than I do. What, what do other people do for MRI and guidance? Yeah, so it, it varies. So in the institutions I have been, um, in, in Calgary, for example, the pathologists, uh, so biopsies were only done once there was an MR because both the biopsy maker and the cath lab uh, wanted to have that, to have some feeling for some guidance. But the pathology labs, that, they, that, that lab just refused to do any diagnostic uh, uh, tests uh, without having MRI results. Uh, whether that's really successful, whether it improves um, um, the, the, the success rate and especially the sensitivity, I do not know. I know the data from Stuttgart and I know that Udo's team is really a, is a great team. So I trust them. But in, in practice, I do not know how much that certainly what I think helps if you for some reason have a strong involvement of the right ventricular side of the septum, then you can recommend, hey, this is probably a good area to take a biopsy from. And if you have, in contrast, you have a very small sub involvement, uh, anterolateral, then and the biopsy is negative, then there's a good reason to say, mm, maybe you have missed it. So, um, but th that's that's all I can yeah. can I, say. So it, I think it varies yeah. between institutions. And, and I'd finally add, Robert Lederman is still trying to do real-time MRI. Uh, mm -hmm. He had a paper in dogs, you know, and so that, that, that effort has not ended despite 10 or more years of effort. We're, they're still pushing on real-time MRI biopsies. Yeah. Yeah, yep. that's so, a that's a different to topic. It's yeah, topic, I wish we yeah. would have yeah we would have more institutions who would have the courage to go for interventional MR because it can do some things nobody else can do. Yep. It's just to get an interventional cardiologist to <laughs> to leave their beaten path and then go a different route. It's just not easy. Thank you so much. Yeah, it, it's another story, but a very interesting one. Yeah, and what's the third question? Yeah, yeah. Is there any any relation or any um? part of being uh, like the uh, myocardial dysfunction, dysfunction by COVID versus myocardial dysfunction by checkpoint inhibitors, because they seem like alike, the same uh, physiopathological mechanism. I'm not sure I got the first part of the question. Uh, the second part is uh, what's the difference between checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis pathologically and what was the yeah. is there? Is there any um, similar points between the heart uh, failure because of COVID or the ventricular dysfunction oh, yeah. because of COVID between the checkpoint inhibitors, this ventricular no. dysfunction? No, I think their mechanisms are completely different. You know, uh, the checkpoint inhibitors, the tumor serves as an antigen presenter and you have a lymphocytic myocarditis. You know, it's uh, when you, uh, we don't do the biopsy, but we do have autopsies and occasional biopsies. And it's pretty lymphocytic, right? Uh, T cells, and it's uh, and it's treated with um, abatacept and you know uh, anti T cell therapy. So I think that is a um, a distinct animal in, in the uh, inflammation. I'll call it inflammation, but it's really myocardial dysfunction that you get sometimes with SARS CoV two. I think that is mediated by multiple different pathways. As Matthias was saying, you get a lot of edema sometimes, but it's not clear that there's a lot of cells. You're not getting a lot of lymphocytes. You may get some macrophages, but there is also some direct injury. And the mechanism of direct injury is very, very different than enteroviral or Coxsackie viral injury. So I think they're mechanistically different and the therapy is different. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Um, 
to me, COVID-19 maybe um, uh, may change how we look at some other viral diseases. So I think we, we may learn that even uh, other coronaviruses that have been around before, but maybe even also other viruses like, um, like uh, EBV or, um, or the common flu may in some patients lead to an edematous chronic response. And the key problem with that is the more edema you have for longer periods, the more likely this will transform then and translate into uh, fibrosis. And if you have diffuse fibrosis, then you, you end up first with HEFPEF and then over time, this may then evolve to a full-blown dilated cardiomyopathy. I think there's a lot to learn, but COVID-19 may present through the ACE2 uh, receptor and the mechanisms for, uh, for edema a, a, a huge uh, learning experience here. Absolutely. Okay. Dr. Mauricio Mejia, ¿se tiene alguna otra pregunta? I would like to finish asking Dr. Friedrich uh, if he has any experience with uh, cases where you have a mixture of a clear uh, ischemic injury, uh, probably just edema, uh, but in a very distinct uh, coronary territory with generalized uh, edema of the heart, for example, uh, or even non-ischemic uh, late cat uh, uh, uptake. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. I, I had a case of a COVID positive patient who, who has a, like a acute coronary syndrome and uh, he continued uh, elevating the troponins and never uh, after, the, after he had the catheter uh, done and they couldn't explain why. And we did the MRI and we showed that there was a, a real uh, um, edema in a definite territory, but the rest of the heart was also inflamed. Mm -hmm. So of course I can only speculate here, but we know that uh, COVID-19 can lead to severe endothelial dysfunction. So if you have, I'm just speculating here, if you have a patient with a plaque that otherwise would have left this patient uh, alone, and by the inflammation of COVID and the inflammation of the entire myocardium, that plaque also gets activated you may have an ischemic injury by a local spasm or by even thromb thrombotic material that accumulates there and then is autolyzed. Auto so it's not there anymore when you're in the cat lab. So I think there's a lot happening in the endothelial, on the endothelial level that then leads to a mix of ischemic and non-ischemic uh, injury. Otherwise, in ischemic injury, if it's severe, and we had just had a patient earlier this week, uh, large infarction, but we saw edema in the entire rest of the myocardium, but this is what I would probably understand as stunning. So this is just the, the, the heart is overwhelmed with the stress because this part of the heart doesn't work anymore. And that leads to global mild injury, which is then as, again as, as edema and an increased uh, T2. Yeah. So I think there is, uh, there is an overlap of the two, and, yeah. And I think I really want to point out for the group that, you know, a lot of the early Wuhan paper, uh, Valentina's paper, the sick, the sick, the papers in this really sick older population who are hospitalized on ventilators, we've all seen them in the hospital. That's a different population than the young athletes, right? So the papers that are coming out by Rajpal and, and others, the Vanderbilt experience, the, there's, Sarah, there's one that I think is coming out, uh, very shortly in CERC and that uh, from Vanderbilt, there's going to be um, a very different, perhaps, phenotype or an imaging type in the young people who are healthy, 19 year olds, never in the hospital, versus somebody on a ventilator who's 70. But he, uh, my sense, Matthias, is they're just different, com different animals. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you very guys. much. Doctors Wesley Cooper and Matthias yeah. Breerich yeah. for joining us. Thank you. Great to see you all. Thank you. We'll have to do it in person again. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye bye, everybody. Gracias. All the best and stay safe. Gracias. Muchas gracias a todos también por acompañarnos. Espero nos puedan acompañar luego. Hasta luego. Gracias a todos. Hasta luego.